the key is to listen to your patient actually okay. um, because <laughs> there's I think I'm really a better physio now that I can't touch my patients because it's so easy, especially at the end of the day when you're a bit tired to just go in and massage people. Um, but the way that you injure yourself, your mechanism of injury gives me about 80% already of what would be wrong there. Okay. And that's when it, where it also helps to be a bit old. I've done physio for nearly 20 years now. So okay. I've, I've got quite a lot of experience from listening to people. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpri. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpri's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today has her mastery, master's in sports injury management. She has two different businesses or two websites where you can find her and her team, sports-injury-physio.com and treatmyachilles.com, started in 2014 and 2018, respectively. Currently, she's also working with a German, German startup, and they're building an app for evidence-based rehab for sports injuries. Unfortunately for us U.S. and North American people, it's not quite available here yet, but if you're in the U.K. or Europe, you can check that out. Welcome to the show, Marika Lowe. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, Marika. And, and uh, you know, as with all my guests, uh, working through technical issues, sometimes we have, you know, just dealing with all the <laughs> Both perks and downsides of technology, um, you know, batteries die, connections die. We've got to like, uh, you know, make adjustments. I don't, you know, you mentioned you had listened to a couple of my episodes uh, prior to coming on. I don't know if you saw the one I did with Alyssa Clark. The only time this has ever happened to me, I was interviewing her. We're halfway through the interview yeah. and storming outside the power of my house just goes out completely. Oh, brilliant. So then I like, I'm like, you know, it, it on her end, as I go, I, I watch back through the recording, what happened on her end is she's telling me this story. Mm. Everything goes dark on my screen. I freeze. She's still talking to me. <laughs> and then like, and then it cuts out and, and she's like, like, where did, are you still there? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I cut it. And I got back on on my laptop and like I had just enough battery to get, to get through the rest of the, the interview and like used what little light was coming through from outside <laughs> as it's storming outside. Anyway, my point being, we make the best adjustments we can with whatever, you know, snafus <laughs> happen. So oh, the laptop's now plugged in, so it shouldn't <laughs> die again. <laughs> Good. Well, and hopefully I, I don't think you, you said you're going to go uh, go out after uh, we're, we're done here. So hopefully there's no storms, or anything that's going to interrupt your situation like it did mine. The glorious thing about Greece in the summer is you have four months of no rain, okay. nada, nothing. So okay. yeah, no. <laughs> is that actually, that reminds me, I didn't write this down, but I do want to ask you is that it's, it's becoming increasingly popular at, you know, as COVID's kind of made people work from home and like get really used to that situation um, I, I think you were involved in this lifestyle well before then, but kind of, it sounds like you're a little bit more of a, I'll, I'll say digital nomad, but you're for free to move around, travel a bit more and not necessarily have a, I'm here 12 months of the year and I take one vacation kind <laughs> yeah. of situation. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. So the whole online physio thing for me, like you mentioned, started in 2014. And when I was creating the website at that point to deliver it, every single physio I spoke to thought I was nuts because they, they went, you, got, you can't do that. Even, I mean, I still get the question of patients, but how do you physio if you can't touch people? And it was literally, it was born from the, we were in Costa Rica for a holiday and I just went, I can't stand the British winters anymore. Do we have to go back? And then you start thinking, how can I do this? That I don't have to have a winter again and yeah so it was it was born out of necessity just to have a lifestyle where you can actually move around 
And what? actually, you your story, sorry, about the, the power cut reminded me a few years back, my dad got ill. And the nice thing is I could pack my laptop and go to South Africa where they live and be there to help out. But South Africa has power cuts permanent on a very regular basis. I remember once having a session with an American patient and just before it started, the power just went out and you know that it's just not going to happen again. And I don't, I still don't know what she must have thought when she came on that call and it was just candles everywhere. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not trying to be romantic, <laughs> but this is all we can do at this point. <laughs> that's, that's not where my head was, like, candles everywhere. I was like, I was like, we're, it, see, you, you went romantic. My head went now we're like in a Buddhist monastery and you're like going to try to convert her into like a, your cult, like come to South Africa. There's, <laughs> this is the, this is the place for healing. Yeah. It's like this whole other situation happening. Uh, no. If I, I, which obviously you don't cause recording patient calls, you don't do that, but it, I wish you had like a, a, a photo of <laughs> that, that situation. Cause I want to yeah. see what that looked like. Oh man, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, I mean, even my friends in Britain, sometimes you say something about growing up in South Africa or a country like that, where things don't quite always work, mm -hmm. and you can just see they go, no, you're making that up, you know, that thing, and it's, but you, yeah, it's, you, you appreciate it when things work again, when you're back in places where things just go as it should. Yeah, well, in, in it's like, <laughs> we take these things for granted, in, in, it, it kind of happened when I I interviewed um, Maggie Mosele, who's a who's a pro cricketer from South Africa, and it was like just where he was. It was like normally he he had, I mean everything was fine, but I, I, he had gone somewhere. Um, I don't know if it was a trip to a friend's house or whatever. And he was on this call with me, and just the internet connection was just spotty. So it, you know I, I ended up going back, and, and it's one of the few times that we really edited the episode because I don't generally edit at all. Um, Cause it was like, he'd say something, but then instead of cutting out, it would like, yeah. it elongated, like pause. Yeah. It'd be like, it, the sentence would to, to me would sound like this. It would be like, Marika, I couldn't believe th that you could, uh, uh, and it would just, yeah, yeah. It, it caught all the information, but it would like jam pauses in between things. So it was like, it reminded me of old school live weather reporting where the reporter is speaking mm -hmm. to the person on site and there's this big gap between like, yeah. how are you doing today? And then there's like five seconds before they respond. It, it, so it was, it, we were doing the best we could uh, with the technology. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of those things that I mentioned sometimes on, on the podcast and I, I, I do it to try to be grateful and appreciative of, of the things that we have and just realize that like, like I am with you speaking of somebody halfway across the planet, like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like we, yeah. we live in the future. Um, I don't think we appreciate that enough sometimes. Yeah, no, but you have to also spare thought for the people in Britain because their internet is just as bad. <laughs> it's, I get better conversation like with you now way further away from me whereas when you try with somebody rural rural in the uk it's like nothing and yeah. it's an island it's meant to be good well we're i mean so where i am we're spoiled a little bit because we were the first city um to have google fiber so that's where i got hooked up in my house so i ah. yeah so and i'm on a hard line uh, i'm not even on wi-fi with the desktop here so I've, <laughs> i'm hooked straight in there should be no lag at all i hope um so yeah, we're at least here in the other cities in the U.S. that have you know fiber internet are mm. definitely spoiled at this point, and, and you you tend to forget like what it was like. I mean, I'm not particularly old, but I grew up with dial-up, and it's like those were <laughs> that was ages ago, and you just forget if you tried to exist on the internet with dial-up now, you might as well just forget it. Yeah, mm -mm. yeah, <laughs> um, but that the point does remain that like what you do is enabled by the internet and uh so first i have to ask uh where were you like four weeks ago because i could have used you um when i like i don't know i tweaked something in my back swimming it was a rest week i wasn't even like doing it, it was the stupidest thing and i, I kept being like exactly what you do i'm like 
I wish there was some way I could just, <laughs> just, you know, call and be like, how do I fix this? So first, thanks for offering such a service. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> because, you know, it's just, so, for, so uh, for you listening, I don't know whether you were in college sports, but if you weren't, um, for those of us that participate in college sports, we, you know, had at least a couple of years of time where you've got direct access to athletic trainers if anything goes wrong immediately yeah. with, without having to, you know, schedule an appointment or, or pay a copay or <laughs> any of that. And so, yeah. you, you know, get used to this, like something's wrong. Somebody can go look at it. Okay. This is our rehab plan, or this is, we're going to tape it today or yeah. just ice it or whatever it is. And then, you know, I'm 10 years post-graduation and now it's like, well, now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually the whole thing that got, um, the founder of this app company that I'm working for thinking about building this app because he was, uh, he's in Germany, he's a runner and he got injured mm -hmm. and he actually consulted me via the internet while I was in Thailand last year, beginning of the ep epidemic. And it frustrated him that he'd not been able to access medical help in Germany of all places where you should have it easily. And he couldn't get the right diagnosis and things. And then I managed to diagnose him how far apart and then he he was working for a startup at that point and he chatted to a friend and they went you know what would be cool if we can build an app that can help people diagnose themselves immediately and then get the rehab that they need mm -hmm. um and yeah it's it's just transformed it because i mean also with the online stuff if you go on the website you'll see oh there's people over the weekends and i mean because of the time differences americans love the uk times because it means that they can get it after work in the evenings early early morning for instance because there's always a physio who's got a slot somewhere along that whereas there's no mm -hmm. ways on earth that your physio at home will be awake at six o'clock in the morning no or that you want to drive to a physio at six o'clock in the morning yeah well it so it, it begs the question a little bit How, you know you mentioned people saying you were crazy when you were starting out um which i, I might add generally when when you're talking about entrepreneurship if somebody calls you crazy either <laughs> you in fact are crazy or you're on to something it's a, it's a coin toss so you know <laughs> I've, I've gone through, <laughs> from one to the other quite a lot in the last few years <laughs> but but so it begs the question like how, how do you if you can't actually touch and physically manipulate somebody mm -hmm. to go okay like does how does this feel does this hurt how, you know that kind of typical way you would go through figuring out where exactly pain points are and what to do, you know, how do you change that? Is it just a matter, like, are we just talking about self-reporting of pain? Are you walking them through stuff? Yeah. So th the key is to listen to your patient actually, okay. um, because there's, I think I'm really a better physio now that I can't touch my patients because it's so easy, especially at the end of the day, when you're a bit tired to just go in and massage people. Um, but the way that you injure yourself, your mechanism of injury gives me about 80% already of what would be wrong there. Okay. And that's when it, where it also helps to be a bit old. I've done physio for nearly 20 years now. Okay. So I've, I've got quite a lot of experience from listening to people. Yeah. Um, so that gives you a good clue. And then you can make them do all the test movements that you would do in clinic, basically in front of you in the camera. And that can, that can give you a really good chunk of the rest of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, most things you can, you can diagnose pretty accurately like that. And it's, but the key there is if you're unsure about something or you think the mechanism of injury makes it that you think mm, there can be something like a serious ligament injury or something, you need to refer. It's not one of those things where you're going to try and fix everything. But there's certain things like muscle strains, tendinopathies. Those things are pure rehab. If you're doing massage or electrotherapy or something for that, you're wasting the patient's money because all the research shows that it doesn't actually work. It needs graded strength training for it. And you can definitely do that via the internet. I think it's it's pretty groundbreaking that you just listen to people. And that's <laughs> <laughs> that's the key. Yeah. Listen to what they're saying. Like, who would have thought you had to listen to what somebody was telling you? Well, you know what? It, it drives me nuts because the number of patients that I get who come to me that says, well, they've just had an injection for plantar fasciitis, for instance, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. Like and then a you cortisol see them, injection or something? 
Yeah, and you you see them and you go, okay, where's your pain? And they point to their Achilles. And you go, that's never going to be plantar fasciitis that's under the foot if your pain is on the Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, well, I told the doctor that. Just didn't listen to their patient, did they? They heard foot pain and they just went with what they they kind of were. They heard foot pain, runner, that must yeah. be it. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's, it's, I know it sounds, oh, that's not a, but honestly, there's so many cases like that. So it, that, that is frustrating. And I think part of like my personal frustration sometimes is that um, I almost just will avoid going someplace, like, unless it's something major, like I ended up actually having a stress fracture in one of my metatarsals earlier this year. Cause I, you know, there's this big push to do all these like lighter and lighter cushier shoes. And just, mm -hmm. I was wearing some of those. They're just, frankly, they're just too soft. And it was just like, we weren't building mileage too fast, but that's the only thing I can break it down to is like, I even ran on it for three weeks and I was just like, yeah, my foot's a little sore, but then yeah. it, there, there came to be a, a, a couple runs. I was like, no, like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So I went and got it you know, x-rayed and it was like, yeah, it's, you should be healed in a couple of weeks. You've been, it's been injured that way for several weeks now. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but, but like, I only went to this guy because my coach recommended it. And like this particular um, doctor does triathlons, is an endurance athlete, is familiar with the culture. Yes. It seems like at least growing up in my parents would do the best for me. If, you know, this is pre-college, like high school, just take me to you know general practitioner it's like mm. it we wouldn't get very good answers or like they'd be like i don't know i don't know what's going on it's like well that's not helpful can you somebody to somebody who actually yeah. knows what they're and even specialists sometimes if they didn't have it seemed like for whatever reason if they didn't have any grounding in like oh this guy runs 40 50 miles a week it's probably related to that yeah well, to be honest, it's, I, I will never forget when I started working with um, the, the doctor that I worked with last in the UK. He was absolutely brilliant. He started out as um, really, really sporty himself. He was in the, um, I'm going to get this wrong now, the Air Force, I think. But then he broke his neck playing rugby. Mm. And that, when he woke up in the hospital, he couldn't move anything below his neck. Yeah. And that obviously changed his life, but he is an amazing person. So he did get some function back and he could kind of walk afterwards, but needed the wheelchair and stuff. And he went on to become one of the top sports physicians in the UK. But that experience, I truly believe made him a better doctor as well, but also because he, he understood sports. And so many times I had people tell me about how, when they, um, went to see a doctor like in the 80s or something and they would say top runner you know I get pain when I run over this they would just say well don't run that much <laughs> you go well that's don't not do really that. yeah that's not really gonna happen is it because also as a runner I know so people will often ask me can I run if I still have some discomfort or something and I know for a fact that I have done that in the past I can tell you exactly with if you've got tip post tendinopathy just choose the right side of the road <laughs> that the foot can't roll in you can probably go for a jog still. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely helps that you, you need a sporty background yourself or just liking sports. I mean, I'm not particularly good at it, at any of it. I just enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, if you've got a sports injury, I would always say, look for somebody who actually specializes in it. I mean, my general practitioner, I want them to pick up if my heart's going to have a problem or you know, I'm going to have a serious thing. I, I don't necessarily need them to know about sports injuries, all of that. But I definitely would like them to be able to refer me to somebody that knows about the right things. Um, so yeah, who you see makes a big difference. Well, it's like, uh, I often, so I'll run this by you because since I'm not a physio, but my general rule of thumb, because I, I also do a, a show on running, where I just talk about you know my experience and thoughts on coaching running and, and how to be a better runner and stuff. Um, and, you know, sometimes people ask questions about injuries and I try to give my best advice and, but also often hedge that with, I'm not a doctor. If it hurts a <laughs> lot, go see a doctor. 
It's you know, because people want to be like, well, you're the running guy. It's like, yeah, but I'm not like, I'm not yeah. certified like to, to consult you physically. So, so my, my general rule of thumb with injuries is if it doesn't alter the way you run, you're probably fine. But as soon as it does, that's a good signal to one stop mm-hmm. and then two see somebody. Is that, is that a fair bit of advice? Kind of. Um, also, if because you've got to also remember, long distance athletes and endurance athletes can tolerate a lot of pain before they take right. note of it. Right. So, you ran with a fracture in your foot for quite a while, by the sounds but, of it. But well, right, yeah, like th- it was like three weeks. But like I said, it just it just felt like it just felt like my foot was sore. It doesn't. It wasn't even like a sharp pain. So it, uh, okay, yeah, it yeah, felt yeah. more like like a, a muscle or a tendon issue than it was yeah. a, a stress fracture. And it, it is an interesting thing that because I'm, I'm busy doing a, a series of um, videos on stress fractures, covering them all from the top to bottom. And it's amazing how many people report that yeah. and how the intensity of the pain cannot tell you whether it is a full on fracture, which it mm-hmm. sounds as if you actually had one that they could see yeah. it on, on x-ray. Yeah, he is just a stress Right. It, it was on x-ray after it, cause it had already been healing. So he could see the, yeah, the section healing. Yeah. Yeah. No. So my, my thing with aches and pains is if it, well, if you're not injured and you're getting a niggle of some sorts, I would say go for a, do an easy session. Definitely not a hard running session if you've got some sort of a niggle, but then check how it reacts afterwards. If it, if it's kind of okay and it's not worse by the next morning, then it shows that it's it's okay. But check that delayed response mm-hmm. because often it will be things like tendinopathies and injuries like those will be absolutely fine while you run. You may even feel that, oh, running's doing it well because the pain's disappearing. But then the next morning you wake up and you go, oh, that's quite stiff. Yeah. And especially at the, at the beginning, it'll be a little bit of stiffness that goes away quite quickly, but then that will start to build. So it's about, yeah, it's, it's what you said described there if it's not going away and it's staying there for a while then i would and especially if it's getting more intense then you need to get it checked this is um kind of a call back to the, the interview you did on the, the run smarter podcast um talking about runners being impatient which is a little bit funny to me because i mean as an endurance athlete it's like your whole goal is to be patient basically like you've got to you can't, cause you know, you can't like this, you can't sprint out and then die off. Like you've got to be patient for a long period of time and to, and to get better, you got to be patient. But then it, like when it comes to injuries, we get very impatient very quickly. Yes. It's like, it's like call it, it's like Brika, I, you know, I ruptured my hamstring yesterday. I need you to yeah. fix me today because I've got a race this weekend. Like yeah. <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> but it just, just doesn't happen. So like, how, how do we, or how do you coach more patients in, into your clients that, that have mm. that, like that need to go faster? Yeah. So <clears throat> to be honest, that's where I've been told I communicate like a German. <laughs> I'm very direct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's the South African part of me. I think I, I tend to not beat around the bush anymore. I give people all the information in the beginning and I, I educate because I believe mm-hmm. if somebody understands what the injury process is that got them there in the first place and then understands how the body actually heals this thing and how long it takes for that process. Now, I tell them that at the first session, it never goes in. <laughs> Two weeks later, they inevitably kind of go, it's still sore. So I get them to mark on a calendar where the time is that we're looking for it to be better at so that they can, because you know how it is. If you've been injured for three days, it feels like four months. Yeah, you, you kind of lose perspective in it. Yes. But yeah, it's about education and it's about also there's no fast rules in these things. So if somebody really wants to get back to thing, I'll, I'll give them, OK, well, test this. Let's see how it goes. And often if they've tested it and gone, OK, no, it's, it's not great. It's not ready yet. Then, then they're quite happy to sit back. And, but I'm also a little bit lucky in the sense that by the time somebody's gone on YouTube and searched for solutions for their problem, they've already usually seen about three, four other clinicians, or they've had an injury for several months. So then they've gone through the whole, I'm angry with 
this injury, I haven't got patience. They, they, they've gone through the grieving and they're in the acceptance phase, mm -hmm. which makes life a lot easier because then if you've had something for so long, you don't want to mess it up. So then sometimes it's more about going, no, honestly, you can start running again. <laughs> just, just, just start again, please. Yeah. So yeah, there's that, that, that hesitation. Cause you're like, you've been through it. You've been through the, yeah. the roller coaster of emotions um, and all those kind of things. And you just, you don't know what to do. So then you finally get to that point where you go, okay, maybe I'll try it a little bit. Maybe it'll be okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I know my, my wife's gone through that. Um, she had uh, surgery for a labral tear and she's like slowly gotten back into running. She doesn't run that much, but it was like, she's taking it very, like mm. she's, she's been super patient. She's it, it yeah. just like way more patient than I would have ever been like building up from like, I'll run for 30 seconds and then walk for a minute and then I'll run for 30 and like yes. building up to now it's like, okay, I'll run for five minutes and then what, I mean, it's been months and it's cause she's, you know, she doesn't want to go through that again. It was such a yeah. horrible, horrible time. Um, and it's like that, that avoidance is more important than, you know, getting yeah, back to performance. To be honest, she's being really clever about it as well, because I so many times meet people who say, no, I can't run again because I just keep on getting injured. And usually when you look at how they're going about it, they have the mindset, a fitness mindset when they're trying to do it. So they, they, they have the same thing of, I've just not trained for a while. I'm just going to ramp it up and I can push through it, you know, all of that. But what they don't understand is that part that you're injured, that tissue's capacity is now reduced. So it doesn't have the capacity to cope with all the load from running because in that sense, running is a strength training stimulus. So for her with her labral tear, every time she goes for a run, that labrum will get some micro damage because we get micro damage all over the body when we run. And it's when the body repairs it that we get stronger. But that repair, after all her rehab, her muscles and stuff will be brilliant and strong. Cartilage would have strengthened a bit, but every run she does acts as a strengthening stimulus for that repair. So she's doing the safest option by going that slowly. And if you've got an injury that just does not allow you to run, then it's likely because you're trying too hard to go in too quick and ramp it up too quickly. So thinking about, um, you know, what my, my wife's doing, trying to get back into all, all of her running and, and workout routines and everything. Um, it, should she, like she, you know, her hip gets a little bit sore um, after runs and she, she's running twice a week and, you know, and doing, um, like strength work the other two days that she works out to try to make sure she doesn't end up back, you know, un, under a, a, a surgeon's knife, so to speak. Um, although it was, it was not that kind of surgery, but, um, so with that, like kind of long-term outlook, I think on the other podcast you've done, uh, the run smarter podcast, um, talking about timelines for mm -hmm. like change, not necessarily even recovery, but I, I think you mentioned something about like, like eight weeks for muscles, but like at least 12 weeks for tendons. Oh yeah. So, to be honest, it's, I think it's even longer okay. for tendons. I've changed my mind since then. Still. Okay. <laughs> We've seen so many now. Yeah. So again, it's useful to think about the structures that's involved. So if we think of cartilage, it takes months and months and months and months for cartilage to get full strength. If we think of just actually, so most of the research into wound healing has been done um, with cosmetic surgery because their wound healing is really, really important. Right. And what they've shown is that the scar tissue of a cosmetic surgery wound actually takes up to a year and a half to fully turn over and settle back into normal kind of tissue. So okay. I don't know if you've ever had a significant scar, you know, where you've just cut yourself or something like that. And it goes that weird purple color for a long time. And then, yeah, then this guy, I, uh, gosh, I don't know what it was. I, I was on a gravel bike trail and I like went over the front of the handlebars and the yeah. gravel like tore it all up. And there was this chunk right here. It was just like black <laughs> purple for a long time. Yeah, you kind of think, oh, okay, that's my weird looking elbow now for the <laughs> yeah. rest of my life. Yeah. And then 
because it happened to me on my leg and just one day you, you kind of look at it you go oh it's normal color now when did when did that happen and it, it literally it takes nearly 18 months just mm -hmm. for that to happen and this is again skin is something that that heals quite quickly although yeah. it's also a lot of collagen in it so the main thing with this type of surgery and for knee meniscus injuries as well is people underestimate how long it takes for that tissue to really fully recover so for her I'm glad to hear she's just running twice a week because I mm -hmm. think that's if she's still getting sore after that, that's probably the perfect kind of volume for her at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then the other important thing with that, because it's a joint, yes, fine, she's doing the strength training, so she's giving it loads of support from the outside. But joints are interesting in the sense, and I never appreciated this when I was younger. Now that I'm getting older, my joints are not pristine. You know how when you sit still for a long period, and then get to move, you go, oh, everything's stuck. <laughs> yeah. That's basically because joints don't have arteries and veins going in and out of them. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting still and they're not getting movement, there's no change in what's happening inside them. So they need movement to get the nutrients in and out, to get the um, inflammatory stuff out. So for any type of jointy issue, if she, I don't know how she feels about things like swimming or cycling, but doing a type of sport where there's a lot of movement, but not a lot of impact can be brilliant for joints and really, really help to feed them. But I know that some runners really hate cycling, so it will depend on what, what she prefers to do. Um, but if she, if she can do it and it's pain free to do, then it's something to swallow like a, like a pull, basically two to three times a week. Um, it can be really useful. Okay. I'll definitely pass that on. I know, I know she'd like to get a bike and we've got the, the perfect kind of environment to do that around mm. here um so she'll probably use that use your advice as like more impetus to be like we need to go get me a bike yeah, so, precisely. so now i know yeah, what we're doing this weekend <laughs> yeah and what what she may find is if she does have the bike and she does regular cycle bike rides she may find that actually the reaction after running is not as much or if she is left with some stiffness after the run getting on the bike and just going for an easy ride should be able to ease that then so th this is probably a duh question, uh, but for clarification's sake, because I, I like to uh, keep everything straight in my head. As I was having a conversation with somebody else the other day, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none kind of person. So I, I need straightening out from time to time. Um, so, so because of the joint situation, um, I know like when I talk about running, getting ready for races, it's like, you want to warm up and part of that is lubricating your joints is that the purpose of that like you have to go through those yeah. gentle motions to get all of the stuff in and out of the joints at that point is that yeah right? so it's it's shocking when i really only at what point in my career i only went what does a warm-up actually do and looked into <laughs> it because the the truth is when i studied physio early 2000s we were pretending to be sports physios, but there was very little sports related stuff in there. It was all about disease and things. So yeah, warm ups are amazing things. So it depends also on what you've done for the rest of the day, kind of what you've already been up to. But if you, for instance, like most of us, you either get up out of bed to go for your run or you're sitting and working all day and mm -hmm. then you get up to go for a run. So in both scenarios, everything would have stiffened up a bit. So mm -hmm. you're lubricating your joints with the warm ups. You're getting that range of motion through it so that things don't suddenly have to stretch when you go because you've also got to remember you've got a capsule around that joint which is like thick ligament type stuff right and if that's been still for hours and hours and hours it's not quite as flexible so you're improving the flexibility of all of those things along, along with it um, and then there's obviously that you're actually waking up your nervous system so i always kind of smile when people go oh i'm doing activation exercises all exercises are activation exercises. If, you, if you're contracting muscles, you're activating them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and I mean, if especially something that I see a lot with my patients who work from home and who ends up sitting a lot before they go out for a run, they can literally cut their injury rates in half if they just get into the, the mindset of, even if it's an easy run, I need to do something to get my hips moving because they've been stuck in flexion all day. Mm -hmm. It's something I, I've kind of recently adopted. I think when I was younger, I could get away with it more, just like heading out the door and go, you know, if, yes. you know, like using the run as a warm up. And then it's like, yes. it's like okay, but you know, as you get a little bit older, again, I'm not old yet, I'm early 30s, but you know, you're starting to feel a little bit. And uh, I, it's just 
advice from uh, Jason Fitzgerald, who's a, a big uh, kind of running advice guy. He has a blog and YouTube. Um, he's on, he's been on the podcast um, and, and he's big into like strength training for injury prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things he does is he has kind of a routine of like strength work, so to speak, prior to going out to run. So like I've added that in or student, you know, do it on top of doing the mobility stuff leg swings and hip circles and that kind of stuff doing some squats and, and calf raises yeah. and like trying to activate all those muscles and get all those things warmed up a little bit before i even <laughs> head out yeah. the door yeah. and it's like that was the big like big i'll say big nugget which is kind of an oxymoron um i took away from him is you know that's something i probably could have been doing for a long time to to yeah. lower injury rate don't you also just then suddenly feel, you know how you can sometimes just feel heavy when you go out? Right. But when you when you do that type of thing, then you just feel as if, oh, I can actually bounce, you know? You yeah, can... the starts have been much better. Yeah, no, you're definitely immediately ready. And there's, so the main research about injury prevention through proper warm-up has been done with football because, I mean, they're forever trying to figure out how to get right. fewer injuries there. So talking about um, soccer, um, that type of football. Yeah. And uh They've shown that they, they created this warm-up plan, which consisted of all of those exercises you've just said, squats, balancing stuff, um, bridges, what else was in there? Um, lots of adductor, you know, just hangs, but all like planks and things that you would think that's strength training. And the injury rates just fell dramatically. Mm -hmm. Then they started applying it to different sports. And one of the most interesting findings with that is that in rugby, it even cut the concussion rates mm. so for some reason either it's because the neck muscles are woken up better that there's less um, force going through there or people are just more alert but yeah they they surprisingly found concussion even went down so and that's now been rolled out to all kind of or validated in all types of sports so it's definitely worth adapt, adopting something like that with um because i'm more familiar with runners i'll say runners but maybe this happens with other other sports do you ever have to convince people that it is actually going to positively affect them? It's not going to negatively affect them. Like, like where it's like, Oh, if I do all these squats, I'm going to be tired. And then I'm not going to, I'm not yeah. going to go run. Well, that's, that's a very important thing. You cannot take your mate who's a really fit club runner who does strength training regularly. If you do the same warm up as them, you're going to be knackered if you're not that fit. So uh, active warm up is brilliant at activating things and getting you ready. But what they've shown is there's definitely a, a kind of Goldilocks number of things to do. Mm -hmm. And that is relative to you. So if you're not that fit, then doing 10 squats is enough. If you're going to do yeah. three sets of 10, you're going to be slow and sloggy and it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be many, but it just needs to be something that gets all the movements that you need or the range of motion and the muscles that you need for the run. Yeah, and that's, that's something that you're thinking about, like picking the right number yeah. And then coupling it with patience, like my run this morning, I knew, you know, it's kind of early ish for me, as far as like the things I have to do for the day um, to talk with you. And I was like, okay, I've got to go run eight miles. That's going to take me, you know, after I get done and do strides and cool down and, you know, do the warm up, and we're, you know, hour 10 or so. And it's, there's this like anxiety mindset almost where it's like, I'll just skip the warm up. I'll just go run. It's like, no, <laughs> slow down. Like it, if it's five minutes, it's yeah. not going to, if five minutes is going to make or break you, like you didn't start early enough. Yeah. And I think getting over that mentality has been probably more of a challenge than actually doing the right thing for me. Cause it's like, you, you want to go fast or you want to get done sooner. Same thing with, I still have to coach myself through, and I, I talk about this with other people, like going slower on your long runs. Like mm. you don't need to fly out the door and try to hammer your every long run or yeah. even most long runs. And you think about it, like, like nowadays I'm running, you know, seven to seven fifteen pace per mile. Um, I'm not, I can't, I can't remember what my kilometer pace would be. So I apologize <laughs> that I don't have the conversion That's on cool. my head. Um, but you think about okay so if i go hammer and i go 650 pace so 20 seconds per mile faster what did i accomplish so then i'm oh well, i'm like 
three minutes faster over the entire run, <laughs> but I, I increased my injury rate like high, but because I'm doing yeah, it all the yeah. time. It's like, just sit and think about it for a second. You're not really helping yeah. yourself by, by doing that. But it's also, you kind of, I find with me in any case as well, and I see it a little bit in my patients as well, is you kind of have to hit your head a few times against that same wall before it goes into your skull that it's not worth it. Yeah. So I've just, I'm, I don't want to jinx it now, but I'm making a comeback from a year long <laughs> injury, which I'm hoping is not going to. So at the beginning when COVID just started, so that was, what was that beginning in 2019? Can't even remember now. It's, we, it's, it's been a weird memory yeah. lost year. <laughs> we had just traveled to Thailand um, for this big change in lifestyle. And uh, <clears throat> of course, suddenly it was really hot. And I just started walking around in flip-flops and walked miles and miles and miles in, I thought, Birkenstocks are good for you. But I forgot that I'm used to really lovely cushioned shoes. Mm -hmm. So after doing that for two months, my metatarsals went, yeah, we don't love you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Of course, lockdown happened in Thailand. Plus, you can't really access things like podiatrists easily because of the, the language barriers and stuff. Yeah. So I couldn't get orthotics again because I obviously was a bit stupid and threw mine away at some point because I thought, oh, I'll have an easy lifestyle, don't need these things. Yeah. And yeah, it, it just, it dragged on. The left side recovered quite quickly, lovely. Right side would not settle. And I had to do the same thing that your wife did, whereas I did make a comeback in December and then I got ahead of myself because I hate running slow and then I paid the price. So this time around 30 seconds on 30 seconds off five times. That was all yeah. that I started with. I'm on 2.5 kilometers now. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. But well, slow. <laughs> yeah. Well, in her, it was such a, such a weird, like she wasn't even, I was, I was writing her workout schedule previously this was several years ago um and we were working up i mean we were working up pretty slowly and it was just she wasn't even up to like running like five kilometers yet like it, it, you know we're still pretty low mileage and it was just she started out and just something snapped and it it, just, it was just such a freak situation God bless. um so but thinking about you know the number of injuries that people go through and you're, you're talking about earlier, um, you know, what do we do? We go to YouTube and we're like, what's wrong with me? And I, you know, I do this too, where I'm like, my go-to actually is, okay, this is my pain. Let's look at like a, um, an anatomical model of muscles and like trying to figure out like which yeah. muscle is, th is the problem and then how do we address it? But it's still self, like, self diagnosis. So I want to ask, how much trouble are we getting ourselves into by, by trying to self-diagnose and self-treat instead of just like calling you up and, <laughs> and getting, getting professional advice? Well, to be honest, patients are sometimes surprisingly accurate with their diagnosis of things because a lot of things are literally, if it hurts on the tendon, it's likely the tendon. Mm -hmm. The problem comes in with the treatment part okay. to it. So take Achilles tendons, for instance. If you Google on the internet how to treat an Achilles tendon, you'll get loads of exercises and things out there. But the problem is that there is no recipe. There is no like one size fits all. It depends on how strong your tendon was to start with. It depends on how long you ignored it for, how mm -hmm. strong you are now, um, you know, how much running you've done in the past, where you start. So sometimes I'll, I'll see patients read, because when you look for tendons, for instance, you'll, you'll get the message that you need to do heavy strength training. So bless them. Then they jump in with this really painful tendon, start with really heavy strength training, and then lo and behold, it's really painful. Mm -hmm. So I would say diagnosis wise, I would never discourage people to go and look for what it could be. But if you want to know what treatment to do, do speak to a professional because they can just guide you as to where the right place is to start and how you need to progress it, because that's where the wheels come off quite, quite often. What I would also say is, if you're not getting better as expected, because the person you see needs to kind of give you a, a timeline for this is what's wrong. This is how long we need to kind of do things before we'll see an improvement. If that's not happening, don't just keep on going back and back and back. If there's no improvement happening, do read up about things. See if people can be wrong. 
anybody can make a mistake. Um, I know for myself in the days where I had to see loads and loads of patients in one day, you get tired, so you miss things. So if you, if you feel something's not right, or you're, don't just assume the person in charge of your care should know what, what it is, have a frank discussion with them. But yeah, do look at Google because it, it can help if you go, but don't you think it could be this or could be that? It is a really annoying as a physio when a patient does that, but it is useful sometimes. Yeah, well, that's, that's the, the, I think the tough thing, because I have, I have friends who are doctors now, and it's like, we have this tendency to, you know, especially, like, especially when we're talking about like actual illness versus injury, it's mm -hmm. like, the, there's a reason that people go through years and years of school and specialization yeah. to diagnose those things, because just a Google search you know, you have a, like a, a runny nose and you Google and it's like, oh, I've got nose cancer. Like it's, it's immediately yeah, it's the worst. Usually, it's immediately it the usually worst comes out as a cancer, doesn't right. it? Yes. Right. So it's like, no, you just have seasonal allergies here. Like here's a Claritin, you're going to be fine. It, so that's where I wonder, you know, it just, it, whether it was that kind of scenario where it's like, we're getting ourselves in over our head. And I know, like you said, uh, the trying to design the rehab routine is very difficult because it, without somebody like you saying okay this is where you are now or this is how we figure out where you are now mm. it's hard to say okay i shouldn't go do mm. you know lift weights what i should start with is like yeah standing up out of a chair yes <laughs> exactly exactly like so and it, it was interesting because in this process of designing the, the rehab programs for the app, you kind of go, how do I do this? You know, how, how do I know when a patient can start or what a patient can do? When do I decide they're ready to progress to the next thing? And then you realize, oh, oh, no, there's, there's definitely set targets that I've mm -hmm. learned through the years. You know, if somebody can't do that yet, then they can't do that. So, for instance, with the Achilles again, we've just learned that if you want to get back to your running, you have to pretty much build up to doing your exercises with weights that's equal to about 20% of your body weight. If you're not at that level and you go back to running, you may be okay for a week or two and then the wheels come off. So there's, there's definitely things like that. But yeah, I would say it's a, it's a mixed thing. I do, I like that people can be more informed these days about things. And I like the fact that patients ask me, can you just write down what it is that I have? Because I know they're going to go read up about it. Mm -hmm. Because I feel if you you have to understand the condition to understand how long it will take and mm -hmm. not rush things and, and, you know, get better at the best rate then. The, the timeline thing, I thought about this earlier. Um, I can't remember whether we were, I think it was pre-recording we were talking about, I had spoken to uh, Rondisa Zuma, who was another pro cricketer from South Africa. And early on, he was like 18, 19 he had what he believed at the time to be a career ending, a career ending back injury. Oh, wow. And it, it yeah. was not like 18, 19 months before he started bowling again. And he, you know, because it took so long, he really thought like things are done before it, yeah. it, it, it even it got started. And it's like, one of the things I talked about with him and I've kind of come to this place too, where it's like, don't set a timeline on it. Just be with it. Like continue yeah. the process and like, you'll get there when you get there. Because yeah. if you set, you know, like I asked you earlier about eight weeks, 12 weeks, it's like, yeah, yeah but <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you get to that eight week point or that 12 week point or whatever it is, and you're yeah. not better, then there's this source of frustration. Like, what am I doing wrong? Why? And then yeah. you've got to go through this whole emotional turmoil instead of just yeah. being like, am I there yet? No. Let's, yeah. What's the next step and continuing yeah. forward. And I, that is the hardest, hardest part. So the first thing to know is that I have not seen an injury that hasn't healed. Um, not meaning myself personally, but I mean, every single injury that a person gets can get better so yes some of them of course if it's like severe trauma you will have adjustments to make but if it's if it's a knee injury if it's an achilles injury all of those things can get better so 
I often get people when something is really painful that they just can't see that they're going to get back to their sport. And the best thing is to, like you said, to not focus on how far you are away from that, but the small steps. And it's difficult when something takes that long. High hamstring tendinopathies is one of those things. And it, it upsets your whole life because when you have that condition, you can't even sit. So you can't go out for food with your friends or anything like that because you can't actually, it just frustrates you. And it's about just keeping people that they keep track of where they were and where and checking in with yourself again. Okay, fine. I can't run 5K yet, but you know what? I ran 30 seconds this week and I couldn't walk two kilometers, you know, five weeks ago, something like that. If you're not going to keep goals like that and keep reminding yourself of it, then you, you're going to, yeah, you're going to lose it. Uh, before we run out of time, I, I want to shift gears a little hard here because um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about this. I, I saw, I, you posted this on your Twitter, I think, um, it, thinking about uh, genetic testing for kids and sports potential. Oh, yeah. Like this, as I said, we're, we're shifting hard gears here, but I, I wanted to ask before, before we run out of time. So, so are, are we really trying to, have you seen the film Gattaca? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, it's ringing a bell. But yeah, that you that you engineer. No, like, yeah, like engineering kids to be yeah. whatever, and then it's like this kid is not engineered, and he's like try, trying to become an astronaut and yeah. trying to do all these things to get through and fake it, basically, and yeah. showing like the, the will of the human spirit as Absolutely. the determiner. Um, it sort of reminds me of that, but like, are we really at the point where we're like, our parents so obsessive? I guess <laughs> that they're like. Is, is my kid going to be an Olympian? I need to know, and I'll pay to know right now. Like, it, it, are we are we there? Is that happening? There, there's definitely crazy research going on about that, and there's companies claiming that they can tell you things like that. And it's important to understand that there's no one or two genes that decides that you're going to be sporty or not. It's such an interaction of things. And a little bit that I understand of it is you still got epigenetics in there as well, which means mm -hmm. there are loads of genes that's asleep and they can turn on or turn off depending on what else happens in life there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say from a personal point of view, I know you need a, a definite standard of genetics, which I missed to be fast and yeah. have explosive speed. But if you take people within that range, there's a lot of different things and it's a lot of mindset that goes into who then makes it or doesn't make it and whether they even want to make it. But yeah, I, I, I just, I feel it's sad when, when things get to that point where people try and control things that much because it takes the fun out of the sport. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, why then? I just, it, it, I don't know. I, I just don't, this is one thing I think my parents did well with me is it like, and maybe it's because I was so motivated myself, but just like, they didn't push me to do anything. It was just like, if you want to do it, you're going to, like, you're going to do it. And that's, and yeah. they kind of let me be. Yeah. And so I think maybe it's in part, it's because that's my personal experience, but I just, I don't get the culture of like, we're, you know, we're going to make you into this world class. You're going to college, you're going to play in the NFL. Or we're just like, why, why are you like, why are you putting so much pressure on, on kids? And, and some of them make it. And I think that maybe that, you know, exacerbates the, the thought process. But I know from having spoken to a, a number of, of Olympians now mm -hmm. that it's like they often played multiple sports and didn't mm -hmm. specialize and like didn't start mm -hmm. those like super crazy training early on. It's like, yeah. Can you look at the evidence and, and say like, chill out? Like it's, it's going to be yeah, okay. So, and I mean, if, we, if you think, quickly about injury management and kids the main injuries they get during those growing years is growth related because they're just doing too much intensity so they've shown that it's much better for development if you want a strong athlete when they late teens or early 20s you need to give them variation because mm -hmm. if they're doing just the same thing interesting with football again they've shown that actually kids who are exposed to lots and lots of hours of high intensity football in a week their hips, the, the bones actually cha change shape to the, mm. to the type of bone that we know or the shape that causes early arthritis in hips. So, because they're soft. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I'm definitely there with you. It's, if you want a strong child who can really perform later on, then give them variation. Yeah. 
Marika, as we're winding down on time, um, a question I'm asking everybody this year, uh, so I can get kind of a cross-sectional response is how do you stay motivated after failing to reach a goal? Oh, yeah. I guess I'm it yeah, I'm I'm quite easy on myself when it comes to exercise goals. I usually just go eat a chocolate or something like that. <laughs> So I'm not, my goals are more with related to the other things, but I think also I'm not too hard on myself. I, I always look at what I've learned from it. So there's always something you learn from, from what you do. And if it doesn't come out exactly like you wanted it, it's something you take with you. Um, and often the goals you don't achieve turns out to be ones that you didn't really want to achieve in the end that much. That's fair. Um, Marika, where can people find you, get in touch, uh, see what you're doing, you know, if they need help, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So you're welcome to either look at the website, sportsinjuryphysio.com, but um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, Marika Lowe. And yeah, um, there's, I think if you want to get in contact on social media, probably my um, Instagram handle is the most the one that I keep an eye on most because the rest, and I need to remind myself now as we speak what that is, which is online.physio.mareka. And those are, if you're on YouTube, those are on the screen. If you're not, they're down in the description. Um, so you should be able to click on those and <laughs> get straight to them. So Mareka, thank you for hanging out with me today. Thank you for having me. It was fun.